and welcome to lesson 23.4 in the Python tutorial series. Uh, lesson 23.4 is a direct continuation of lesson 23.3. In that lesson, we made the beginnings of a the shell of a text adventure game that could parse through user input and look for keywords in full sentence input by our users. We're going to expand on that concept a little bit in preparation for project number five. If you didn't follow along with lesson 23.3, we are going to start with some code on the screen that's already been developed. So you can either copy that code in to your uh, Python shell or into your Python programming window if you want to start with us here. Or you can go back and follow along with 23.3 to make sure that the stuff we do here makes sense. At any rate, let's go ahead and continue developing our adventure game in lesson 23.4. So here we are back in our Python programming window, and you can see the program that we had from the last lesson is up. So if you run this program now, just to make sure that everyone's in the correct spot, we have the ability to enter, an, enter our character's name, and our program understands look, it understands look at the tree or look in tree and it can also identify the word eat. Finally our program will quit when the user types in quit. So that's where we left off. Let's go ahead and add some new features to this adventure game program. In order to add a little flair to our adventure game we want to describe the room the user's in. The way I'm going to do this is by creating a new function and this function will be called describe room. Now right now, there's not going to be any parameters for describe room, but later I'll show you how to add some parameters that can change the description of the room as certain events take place. So this function will describe the current state of the room. And we'll add some print statements here. So we'll say print you are in a small office. And let's go ahead and put a TV in the corner. So you see a small TV in the corner. It's not turned on. So now we got a TV and then we'll say there is a filing cabinet on the far side of the room. And finally, let's uh, put a desk and say print there is a desk with a small chair in the center of the room. So there we've added just some uh, description and some flair for our room. In order to access describe room, the user's going to have to look around. So instead of having this user typed in look, but we're not sure what at, I'm going to change this to run the describe room function. By doing so, if the user types look at the tree, which I'm not entirely certain we're even going to have a tree in the scene anymore, um, this block of code would execute the look at tree. But anything else, if the user were to just type look, or the user to type look around, look around the room, anything with look that doesn't have a specific object attached to it will simply describe the room. We can go ahead and run this program and see if it's working properly. So we enter our character's name. What do you want to do? Look around the room. And we can see the user typed in look. We don't need that check anymore. So I'm going to erase user typed in look because it worked well for testing, but we don't want that line there anymore. And it's printing, you're in a small office. You see a small TV in the corner. It's not turned on. There's a filing cabinet on the far side and the desk with the chair is visible. What do you want to do? So we've now added a way for the user to see very simply where they are. Um, we might even want to add describe room before the initial loop runs so that when the user enters the game, they get a description of the room as it stands so that they have a better idea of what they're being expected to do. With those two changes, we can test this program again, enter the character's name, and get a description of the room and now they're asked what to do, and this probably gives them a better idea of some of the things that they can have the opportunity to do while they're in this room. Now when I look at this program as it stands right now, um, I notice some things in this description that might give my user clues what I want them to do. I'm noting right here that there's a small TV, 
and that it's currently turned off. When I read that, I'm sort of implying that the TV can be turned on, so let's add that functionality to our program. I need to think, what would the user type if they wanted to turn on that television? More than likely, they would type in, turn on the TV, turn on the television, or some variation of that. I'm going to add functionality to my program to, de to determine whether the user types in, turn on. So I'm going to add an elif statement here, and just like my others, um, it's going to be response.lower.find, and it's going to look for turn on, and check to see if that value is equal to negative 1. If that statement returns true, I know that the user has typed in turn on. Next, I want to give it a target. I want to see if the user typed in TV or television. I might assume at this point, since there's only one thing in the room that could be turned on that they want to turn on the TV, but I want my program to possibly in the future be able to discern other things the user might want to turn on, like perhaps a radio. I'm going to add another if statement here once we find turn on, just like we did for tree here. Once we find turn on, we're going to look at the response again and see if we can figure out what the user wanted to turn on. So if response.lower.find is set to TV, and that's not equal to negative 1, then I know the user typed in turn on and the word TV in the same sentence. And the user might type in television as well. So I want the same line to check to see if the user typed in TV or television. I can do that by adding a simple OR statement and say if response.lower.find equals television, or the argument is television. If that's not equal to negative 1, then I know the user either typed in TV or television. And I can print the appropriate message. You turn on the television. It is currently playing the news, or whatever message I want. Otherwise, I'm going to print a message that says, I'm not sure what you want me to turn on. So if the user types, on, types in turn on, but then doesn't specify the television, it's simply going to tell them we don't know what the target of their turn on command is. So let's go ahead and test this now. So our program runs, and I'm going to type in turn on. And correctly, our program says, I'm not sure what you want me to turn on. So I'm going to try turn on TV. And the TV is turned on through the print message. I could also type in turn on television and get the same effect. Now that's all well and good, except at this point, um, actually let's run that program again. I'm going to turn on the TV. Oh, actually, my name is Turn On TV. So Turn On TV is going to turn on the TV. And the message tells me you turn on the television set, which is fine. But when I look around the room, it's still telling me that the television set is turned off. I need a way to keep track of whether or not the user has turned on the TV. And the way I'm going to do that is by creating a variable. So at the top of my program, I'm going to go in and create a variable that represents whether or not the television has been turned on. So let's call this variable TV, and I'm going to set it equal to a value of false, meaning the TV has not been turned on yet. Then, when the user turns on the TV, after I tell them that the TV has been turned on, I'm going to take that TV variable and set it to true, because now the TV has been turned on. We're not quite done yet, though. Our description will still always say the TV is turned off. In order to dynamically change our room description, I now know that my describe room function needs to know the status of the TV. So I'm going to add a parameter to describe room called TV. This will be a true false value that lets the program know whether or not the TV has been turned on. Then I'll add a quick if statement that says if TV or in other words, if the TV value is set to true, or if the TV is turned on, we're going to print, you see a television in the corner playing the nightly news, because we know the TV is on. Otherwise, we're going to print the TV is turned off. The last thing I need to do to make this functional is change 
all of my function calls for describe room to pass in the value of my TV variable. If I were to run this program right now without doing so, I'm going to get an error message. Describe room takes one argument and none are given. That's because I've added this parameter here to describe room and I haven't changed it in my function calls. So let's add TV to the initial describe room as well as the one that's called when we look around. I run this program. I look around and this TV in the corner is currently turned off. If I look around again, I can see nothing's changed. But then I'm going to turn on. I'm not sure what you want me to turn on. I want to turn on the TV. You turn the television on, it's currently playing the news. Even though I can't see it as a user, the TV value has now changed to true. Now, when I look around the room, this message has changed to you see a television in the corner playing the nightly news. Because I'm keeping track of the TV status in this variable, I can now dynamically change the room's description based on that particular variable. With the TV now handled, uh, we can address some other things that maybe our user will do. I can see that the next line of the description tells me that there's a filing cabinet in the far side of the room, and I can assume that maybe my user will try and open the filing cabinet. Because of this, I'm going to scroll down and add some new functionality to my program and say elif response.lower.find is equal to open. Because our user might type in open filing cabinet, and I'd like to give them a reasonable message in return. So find open is not equal to negative one, meaning that they typed open. We're going to look for the target first, in this case, a filing cabinet. So if response.lower.find filing, and I'm going to limit it to filing. I could do filing cabinet here, but I think if they type filing, I can assume they're writing cabinet there at the end. Is not equal to negative one. We'll print out an appropriate message and they'll find that the filing cabinet is locked. So you attempt to open the filing cabinet, but it is locked. So they're unable to open the filing cabinet. Otherwise, we'll print our standard message of, I'm not sure what you want me to open. Our user now can type in open filing cabinet and get an appropriate message about the filing cabinet. So let's test this out. We run our program and type in open and I get the expected message. I'm not sure what you want me to open and open filing cabinet results in the message. You attempt to open the filing cabinet, but it's locked. Well, that's no good. I want to be able to open the filing cabinet, but we need the key. I'm going to add the key functionality to my program next, and as I envision the scene, there's going to be a key on the desk. To find the key, the user is going to have to look specifically at the desk. Now, I have this unneeded find or look at tree command, but we'll leave the tree in there and add a new look command, a new look target. So in this block, this will only execute if the user typed look. If they type look, I want to check and see, are they looking at the desk? By adding that desk command, it now my program now knows whether or not the user is looking at the desk. And if they are, we're going to print, you find a small, or you see a small brass key under some papers. This will be a key to the user that they can now get a small brass key from the desk. Probably after they read that message, they'll type get key. So I'm going to add a new check for the word get. And if they type get key, so let's add key to our list of words that our program understands, We'll print the appropriate message. You take the small key from the desk. Otherwise, we'll print, I'm not sure 
what you want me to get. Since we've added quite a bit of code to our program since we last tested it, let's go ahead and test it again. I want to test the ability to look at the desk, so let me just try look, and I can see I'm still getting a room description. Look at desk. I see a small brass key under some papers, that's fantastic. Let me try get by itself, and it tells me I'm not sure what you want me to get, and I want to get the key, and I get the appropriate message, you take the small key from the desk. Now, just like I did for the television set, I need my program to keep track of whether or not the user has gotten the key. I'll add a variable here to the top called key and set it equal to false so that the program knows when I start, when I first run the program, the key has not been obtained. Then, when the user takes the key, after they get the message that they've taken the key from the desk, I'm going to set the key value equal to true. My program now knows that the key has been obtained by our player. Now I can do a third check inside my open command to see whether or not the user has taken the key. So if I find open and, and I find filing cabinet, I know the user typed in open filing cabinet. Now I need to check whether or not they have the key. So I'm going to do another if statement. If the key has been found, I'm going to print, you take, you rifle through the filing cabinet and take some papers. So our user it just took some papers from the filing cabinet. Otherwise, if key is not equal to true, it's going to tell the user that they attempt to open the filing cabinet, but it's locked. Let's see if this mechanic works in our game now. We're in the room and we want to look at desk, we find the brass key, we get key, the small key is now in our possession, and if we open filing cabinet, I get the message you rifle through the filing cabinet and take some papers. Conversely, if I try and open the filing cabinet, without first getting the key, I'm getting the message, you attempt to open the filing cabinet, but it's locked. By following this pattern, there's really no limit to how far your adventure game can go. Now that you have this base code finished, let's go ahead and try to add some more features in the Lesson 22.4 Challenge Program. <laughs> The Lesson 23.4 Challenge Program assumes that you have the same base game that we wrote over the last two lessons. What we're going to do is add some more functionality to our program that wasn't in the program when we left to start the Challenge Program. The beginning looks remarkably the same. We can uh, see the room, we can try and open the cabinet, and see that it's locked, and we can get the key and then we can open the filing cabinet. So all this stuff is the same. Where I chose to focus this challenge program is with the television, because right now when I look around the room, I can see that the TV is off, and I can turn on the TV, and it's playing the news, and that changes the description of looking around the room, but I want to add some different TV channels that the user can look at. I'm going to have the user type in change channel. When they do that, it asks them to input what channel they'd like to change to in the range of channels one through three. I only progr programmed in three channels. Let's say the user makes a mistake and they type in Z. I get a message that says, I don't believe you can change that channel, and the program continues. And the TV continues to play the nightly news. But if I select a correct channel, let's say channel two, I can see that channel two has a football game playing instead of the nightly news. If I change the channel again, to channel three, and see now the TV is playing an infomercial for a set of kitchen knives. And this works as well when I look around the room or some other command. 
So I've added functionality to the TV that gives the user the ability to change the channel. Now this might be inconsequential, it might have nothing to do with my game, or there might be an important clue on one of the channels. That is really up to you. The way that I decided to do this was I wrote a function in my program called change channel. That took user input, asked them what channel that they wanted to change to, and if they entered a valid channel, one through three, it returned the correct value. Otherwise, it simply returned whatever channel the TV was on prior. So play around with that, see if you can get the TV to properly change channels, and if you can, you are definitely ready to take on project number five. That will be the next video in which we're writing ourselves a proper adventure game with, uh, I, I kind of envision it as a side quest to a larger adventure game, where you'll take all these techniques and put it together in a game that's your own. For this challenge program, just go ahead and give the TV some added functionality. And as always, if you have any questions and something's not working out for you, leave those in the comments and I can help you out to make sure that your program is working correctly. Thank you so much for watching the Python tutorial series, and I'll see you next time.